In 1994, I left Forsyth and chairman of, uh, of that department, or head of the toxicology department. Then um, what I found in that study were three basic conclusions. There was no question that behavior was vulnerable to fluoride. Whether you got a very short exposure, and this in animals, if, you, if, you're, if they're young, if it's prenatal, or if it's early postnatal, all you needed was two or three days exposure to this. And it caused a permanent change in behavior when the animals grew up. That's all the exposure. If you took all the, way, all the other exposures away and they got none other but that one exposure, that was it. It was enough to permanently change the behavior. Now, um, also in that study, we found that the effects varied with age. If you were prenatally exposed, it was hyperactivity was the problem. If you were ex exposed as adults or at weanlings, we called it the couch potato. The problem was is that they, uh, they, they were hypo hypoactive and very slow. Also, we found that the um, fluoride accumulated in the brain. And this is very different than what the literature had said before. Because the literature had shown before, um, but they didn't do it appropriately, they said that it does not get into the brain and it does not accumulate. And we know that that is wrong. And this is just to show you some levels, for example, a control and exposed female in the hippocampus of the brain. Uh, some of the areas are, are it's doubling and tripling in actual amount of fluoride in those regions of the brain. So we knew we were in trouble. The paper came out, and um, I started getting response from all over the world. And that's when I started learning that there's more to this fluoride story than just that it's good for your teeth. I, I got more information because I was upsetting people by saying this. And I learned that fluorine is a natural element. It is in, pre in a lot of different things. It's more common than chlorine and nitrogen, or as common as chlorine and nitrogen. And it's more common than carbon, even. And because it's so ubiquitous, that assures that you are going to be exposed to fluoride, whether it's in your drinking water, whether it's through the air, whether it's uh, uh, you know, via food or soil. You're still going to get exposures to fluoride. The other thing that was concerning was there are a lot of occupations out there that you are being exposed to fluoride to whether you know it or not. If you work with aluminum, if you work with magnesium, if you work with any petrochemical, if you are in coal production, if you work in a glass factory or a brick factory or a tile factory, all of these will assure that you are going to be exposed to fluoride. You absorb it through your skin, you can inhale it. And to your body, it doesn't matter where this fluoride is coming from, your drinking water or, what, or wherever it's coming from, to your body, it's the same thing. I found that fluoride is at the hazardous waste sites, the EPA's national priorities list. Yes, it's a pesticide, as mentioned before. And then I found that fluoride is used to process uranium and it was used to produce atomic energy. And so this really concerned me because I didn't realize, coming from a dental institution, I thought that fluoride was only coming from drinking water. I really didn't realize that when I drank a Coke, when I drank Snapple tea, when I drank grape juice, that I was really adding to my body burden of, of fluoride with all these others. So I thought this was important enough to submit another grant in 96. And the information, they were still a little scared about this, and they said, gee, there doesn't seem to be a link between the brain or bone problems. I don't see how this could be possible. And then in walked Cliff Honecker into my life, and he walked, and he says, he asked me two questions. I'd never met or heard from this before. He knocked on my door in this, this summer, as a matter of fact, in 1996, and he asked two questions. He asked me about my CNS work, and he asked me about my relationship to Harold Hodge. Remember, Hodge was one of the people in my department of toxicology I'd worked with, and he, would work, he was a chief pharmacologist on the Manhattan Project. This man had never said anything to me in all that time. He asked me lots of questions about what we were doing, but he never actually said what was going on. Cliff showed me some documents then from the Manhattan Project that had recently been declassified. I then got a publication from 1949 where this man had been there 
when they actually started working with the fluoride and did the original toxicology studies. And they described what happened to some of these people when they were accidentally overexposed to fluoride. And here is what he found. All the seriously injured individuals were unusually nervous, apprehensive for four to five days after the accident. One individual was definitely overstimulated for about three days, exaggerating all facial expressions and being unusually verbose and talkative. At times, he was almost incoherent. The other seriously injured patient, although normally quiet and placid, became very apprehensive with a similar tendency toward the exaggeration of statements. The opinion of all observers held that the mental reactions were more than could possibly be explained on a fear reaction basis. The second accident that they had, the mental status for the first five or six days following the accident was marked by general sluggishness, the couch potato syndrome, with transient, transient periods of restlessness, irascibility, and nervous tension with occasional silliness and loss of contact. Does that sound like anybody you know?